Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. <coughs> I will uh, entertain a motion for the approval of the minutes for the, of the July 25th meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Thank you. Um, item 1-5, public forum on agenda items. Is there anybody here that would like to speak to the Committee of the Hall? Do I need to do that three times? No. No? No. Okay. Fine. Well, thank you. Okay, then we're going to go down to item 2-1. Uh, uh, and this is a uh, resolution 131-1617 by law and licensing charter ordinance number 1617 by Lewandowski, Alderman Lewandowski, Herman, Rob, uh, being subject to the home rule provision of section 66.0101 of the Wisconsin statutes to maintain the number of older persons in the city of Sheboygan at 16. Alderman Lewandowski. I just want to give a little speech. I think all of us have heard or had to learn Lincoln's Gettysburg Address in school. In part of the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln also memorized the sacrifices of those who gave their lives at Gettysburg and extolled the virtues for the listeners and a nation to ensure the survival of America's representative democracy that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from this earth. By reducing the council to only 10 older persons and removing older persons and citizen members from reduced committees, we are taking away Sheboygan representative democracy of government by the people, for the people of Sheboygan. 16 older persons give the people of Sheboygan more representation than only 10 older persons. In 1941, according to a Sheboygan Press article, Alderman Fairweather of the Common Council introduced a proposal for a referendum to have eight aldermen or leave it at the then 16. The Common Council decided against going down to eight. Among the reasons given were a large majority of the people were against it. There would be better representation with 16 aldermen. The city was growing in size and population, and the aldermen had to represent more people with more work involved. In 1941, the population of Sheboygan was 40,638. The city limits on the north was North Avenue, on the south was Union Avenue, on the west was mainly 18th Street. The same reasons in 1941 still apply today because the city is larger in size and population. Going down to 10 older persons would mean that fewer people would run for aldermen because most people that run won't run against an incumbent. It would also lower voter turnout because many people won't make an effort to vote if there are no interesting offices to vote for. For example, last February's primary election when there was only one election to vote for, and that was a primary for state Supreme Court justice, and the voter turnout was very low. If the citizens only have to vote for an alderman every other year, voter turnout will decline. The people of Sheboygan have already had their government by the people taken away by not being able to vote for the person who runs the city. Now going down only 10 older persons would take away even more government for the people, by the people. 
it would also mean that a smaller percentage of aldermen would be controlling the whole common council. Reducing the number of older persons would also mean fewer older persons for committees. Each older person would have to serve on two standing committees in order in addition to other committees. Some committees would need to be reduced to three members instead of the current five. This would mean a phone call between two older persons on the same committee could result in a walking quorum and they could block anything on the committee if they wanted to or, or pass anything you wanted to on the committee. Alder person Donahue said a few weeks ago that the people on the council now can be trusted not to do that. But can we say that the people on the council three years from now will be trustworthy? Three years ago, we had an alderman on the council, Kevin Matichek, who pleaded no contest to a charge of a public official accepting a bribe when he tried to prevent a Sheboygan tavern owner from getting his license renewed. Five older persons on the com committee made this more difficult to do. But if there had just been three, it would have been a easier to get one more to join him. More committee meetings would need to be canceled because with a committee composed of three members, two missing members would mean no quorum is present and no meeting could be held. With the current five member committees, two missing members would still leave a quorum and the committee meeting could be held. I saw this a few weeks ago when one committee was down to only two members, when one committee member was not able to be at the meeting, a second older person had to leave early, and a third member had to leave for a few minutes, leaving only two members out of five and no quorum. I have heard from many people in Sheboygan that they called out called one of their aldermen, but were never called back. If they only have one alderman in their district and that alderman doesn't return their phone calls, who do they speak to? Especially when one alderman has answered emails from Sheboygan <coughs> citizens saying he is not interested in what the citizens think because they don't live in his district. A larger council would also provide more knowledge and life experiences that may be important for the council to know in a considering a vote. I ask all the older persons to vote to retain the current 16 older persons so that the people of Sheboygan can truly have a government for the people, by the people. Thank you, Scott. Are there any other comments? Any other aldermen? I have some. Yeah. Yeah. Are we going to introduce uh, the agenda item before, or, or is, I mean, is there going to be further discussion or are you going to just go to vote without a first or a second or anything. Nobody's made a motion to adopt or anything yet. Okay. Well, I was so going to speak after it was second. Okay. Well, we can. We can. Um, do we have a motion to approve, or send? It, or send, uh, would we be sending this resolution to the uh, Common Council with a favorable recommendation? I make a motion. Okay. Second. All right. So there's been a motion and a second. Under discussion, Alderman Jose. I did. A, I had the city clerk office do a little research because uh, I was just curious. But uh, for the for the alderman for the aldermen that have, that voted to uh, reduce the council from 16 to 10, which does increase the work burden for the other aldermen, have in, in less than a year since voting to do so either resign their position or let their term expire and did not run for re-election. So if you take those four aldermen out, this resolution wouldn't even pass when it, uh, when it was voted on last oh. year. Thank you. Alderman Herman. Thank you. The, the more I think of this, the more I believe we should keep it at 16. Even if I was not on the council, I would still think 16 is an appropriate number because then you always have enough people to, to help constituents if older person A is not available or person B is available. Um, I think that my tenure or anybody else's tenure here should be decided by the people that pay our salary by the taxpayers. I mean, if they, if they want somebody out, they should vote us out. It shouldn't be determined by somebody who proposed an, old, uh, an ordinance that's no longer on the council. I would prefer that 
it stay at 16. Because I think if you don't have 16, you're opening up a can of worms that doesn't necessarily be, need to be opened. You're not going to have enough people to fill a committee. You're not going to have enough people to answer phone calls. Let's say you have an older person who's ill for an extended period of time or on vacation, and constituent A can't get a hold of that person. The other older person is available to take on that that responsibility. Um, that's that's what I truly believe. I mean, if the taxpayer wants. 10, they should have 10. If they want 16, they should have 16. But I think it should be decided by the people that voters in. I think if you do reduce the council, you should reduce it by two or four. But I think if you reduce it from 16 to 10, you're in big trouble. Because let's say six can't make it to a, to, to a regular council meeting. I mean, I, you, know, you, you just don't have enough people it's a, you have 10 and 6 can't make it, then you have 4, you just have enough for a quorum, and you can't have that well-rounded, broad discussion that you could have with 16. So I would really prefer that it stay at 16. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Hearn. Alderman Tresser. My concern is that we are here, we are elected by the people of Sheboygan to do a job. Now we decide amongst ourselves that we are no longer going to have 16 but 8. It was never brought to a referendum. And according to this paper here, it says the public did not object and there were no petitions presented. <coughs> well, I was the public when this was voted on. Never heard anything about the fact that this council was planning on reducing the number from 16 to 10. And I think that if you're going to do anything to reduce the number of this council, it should be by referendum vote. The people voted us in. They should be the ones to say, yes, we need to downsize the council a little bit, or no, we want the 16 members to stand. Thank you very much. Is there anybody that I, that I missed that wanted to make a comment? Uh, Alma Sard. Thank you. I, too, have changed my mind about the number of aldermen. I believe we need to maintain the 16. Um, I think I can validate that by the number of <coughs> meetings that I attend that I'm worried if a quorum is even going to be happening. Um, the number of calls I get from people outside my district that their alder persons aren't answering their phone calls. And I think it's important that we all answer any call that comes our way. And just in light of, of the flavor of how I feel things have been changing within the council, I'm curious, I mean, I don't know how many of you were here when the vote was to reduce it, but I imagine the vote on this will give me my answer. But I'm curious as to what the flavor is of this current council as to how everyone feels about it being either 16 or 10. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Did you want to say? Alderman Thiel. Thank you. Um, I was here. I originally voted in favor of the, uh, the reduction myself, um, mainly because I wanted to see how the committee structure was going to happen, because um, we really didn't have an idea on that. It sounded good on paper. Let's take it to the next step to see what it's going to look like. Um, after taking a look at how committee assignments are going to line up, how other people are going to line up, that's where I now have a concern of going down to, the, down to that number. Um, one is I look at combining a couple committees that I sat on both of, law and licensing and the, and now currently produ public protection and safety. You combine those two meetings. I know they're talking about taking some things out of there so it wouldn't be as long. That's going to be a pretty long meeting. Um, I really feel sorry for that last person on that, on that agenda. Let's say it's one of the public protection and safety ones that's last on the agenda. They've sat there for two hours, maybe more, waiting for their item to come. I'm seeing three older people here who really don't want to be sitting here for three hours, and I'm sure they wouldn't be. Are they going to get a fair shot at what they want, want their argument to be? I have a little concern for that. Um, also with the number. Um, I can't see three people um, taking on a, both of those committees at one time. I think that both of those committees need to have five uh, older people on it to make a decision. We're voting on somebody's, you know, livelihood at some times and I don't think it's fair to the public to give 
three people, or maybe even possibly two if somebody can't show up, um, you know, you're t telling, let's say it's uh, Alderman Bitters and I running the whole show for how many people are trying to decide their livelihood. That's not an easy thing to do. Um, I don't think that's fair to the elder people, or is it fair to the public who is coming before us? So um, now that I've seen what is proposed, I'm definitely now in favor of sticking with the 16 older persons. I am in favor of still reducing some committees. I think we have way too many committees. Um, I think some of those could be either eliminated or combined with something else. So, thank you. Thank you. Is there any other comments? Alderman Lewandowski. I also agree with Alderman Thiel. I think that we can still eliminate a few committees or combine a couple committees but still stay at the 16 aldermen. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Tresser. I have to agree that I could see where some of those committees could be eliminated, some could be combined on not law and licensing and public protection and safety because law and licensing goes two and a half hours sometimes. Um, but I could see where some could be combined. But cutting down the size of the council for me is just not a not good planning. Thank you. Any other comments? Alderman Rob. I am in favor of keeping the alderman to 16 versus reducing it to 10. I think being a part-time position and working full-time as we all have professional positions outside of this, it's really a hard balance between work and family. So I think if you reduce it to 10, something's going to fall off. Either you're going to fall off and you're going to have to resign your position or you're going to have problems at home in your family life. So I think keeping it to 16 is a good balance. If in the future, um, you know, a possibility would be where you would want to reduce it. I only see the only way to make that happen is to make it a full-time paid position. Um, I don't think the budget's there. I don't think that's even part of the conversation. But I think in the long term, five, seven, eight, ten years from now, that might be a consideration. But today, I think keeping it to 16 is a good number. Great. Thank you very much. Any, Alderman Bellinger. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I've got a, a question. I don't know if it's, it's for you or for somebody that's on the subcommittee that was checking to find out Okay. from the strategic fiscal planning who was going to reduce the, the committee structure. Mm -hmm. But I haven't seen anything on that. And so I don't know what these other people have seen or, okay. you know, I, I mean, I didn't, I don't know if anything has been disseminated to the rest of the council. It was attached to your materials. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. So um, <coughs> I will look that, look that over. Um, but my other question would be, what are the legal ramifications of taking this vote? Because wasn't there a timing issue of, of doing this and it being a charter ordinance and, and things associated with that? Um, I'm okay. Uh, attorney. Sure. Thank you. It's nice, though. Yes, there is a... Uh, uh, timing issue. Um, it is our recommendation at, at the city attorney's office that you not pass this charter ordinance. Uh, there are some significant problems that you run into if you do so. Two things basically. Any charter ordinance before it goes into effect must go through a 60 day waiting period to give the public the opportunity to object. That happened with the prior uh, charter ordinance. That 60-day period, if you would approve this at the September meeting, gets you now into November. Now, potentially, uh, <coughs> during that time, someone could already take out their papers uh, to run for alderman. <coughs> if they're taking out their papers to run for alderman, they'll be taking out papers for a one-year term because the current charter ordinance that is in effect uh, indicates that anyone who's running for office of alderman in the next election will be running for a one-year term. You now potentially make this change and it turns it into a, a two-year term. Even more seriously, uh, <coughs> if during that 60-day period there is an objection and there are petitions that are filed, um, there needs to be some time to consider those petitions to make sure that they're appropriate, that they're verified, uh, but then it would go on the ballot. The next, it would go up for referendum, the, the current 
charter ordinance that you have in front of you to reduce or to increase from 10 uh, to 16. The problem with that is it would be on the April ballot and you will already have people running for a one-year term in the February primary and the April election and you will also have on the ballot uh, uh, charter ordinance that purports to go back to what happened before and increase uh, the uh, aldermanic term from one year to two years. You can't do that. Uh, so um, if you continue to wish to move from 10 to 16, <coughs> the proper way to do it would not be to approve this ordinance, but really to put together a charter ordinance after the next aldermanic election uh, or at least that goes into effect after the next aldermanic election that takes into account the fact that you are going to have a <coughs> class of aldermen uh, that are in uh, office for only one year. Um, I did indicate that uh, issue uh, to uh, the alderman who came and visited me on this, um, but uh, you certainly your prerogative to continue to vote on it, but it's going to be a, a real legal problem if you do it, and um, I would not recommend you do that. Thank you. Alderman Jose. I don't see the legal problem. My math is maybe a little fuzzy, but I think from September 5th to December 1st, there's 86 days. I could be wrong about that. We got the entire month of October, the entire month of November, and at least 25 days in September. Uh, and you can't circulate nomination papers before December 1st. So unless has that, has that changed? I think that's the same, isn't it? So since you can't take out papers, and the, the, at the day you take them out is when they define what goes on that paper. Um, there's, there's not only 60 days for the public after the next regular council meeting to object. There's another 25 days after that. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Tresser. I think what's important here, too, is that in this room there are 16 aldermen. Well, 15 right now. Each one of them have the right to be heard. By taking this vote, we are stating our position and how we feel. And I believe that everything else can be worked out. I don't believe it's as cut and dry as what it may be, seem to be. And I would like to see this vote can be carried out. I'd like to see it be put on the, as a referendum vote. And I'd like to see the people of Sheboygan choose. Thank you very much. All of my bidders. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I I have a problem with the characterization that uh, somehow this body came up with this uh, it <coughs> secretly, stealthily, that the public wasn't given notice. We followed all of the rules. Uh, the 60-day the period, it, it, it made it through this body, it made it through Common Council, <coughs> voted on it, we agreed to it. If you're having second thoughts, that's fine, but I don't, I don't want anyone to feel like we got away with something because we really weren't trying to do that. Uh, it, there, there was a 2010 or 2012 study where they compared us to similar bodies in other cities, and they said, wow, your council's bigger than everybody, everybody else's. That was kind of the prevailing thoughts behind it. As to the the recommendations for the the, the new committee levels and the and the number of committees, fine. It was a recommendation. There's certainly tweaking that could be done to it. It's a recommendation, but it, 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 you know, it doesn't have to be decided today. It, I would stand by, it, we did what we thought was right when we voted on it at, at the previous council. It, and there was a public comment period. Someone could have objected. We could have got it on a referendum. It didn't happen saying, well, we didn't know, doesn't, doesn't quite register for me. Uh, and it, just personally, I'm going to stick with the, uh, what we voted on in the previous council to uh, go to uh, 10 people. Uh, 
you know, I, I took it, what Attorney Adams wrote to heart in, in his his background uh, that, yeah, this is going to cause larger issues if we suddenly say, yeah, we, we were kidding or we changed our mind. There's, uh, there's, you know, we're, we're opening ourselves up for a, a large mess. You know, if at some point they want to bring this back after the, the nomination and, and election period, all right. I, I just, I, I have a problem with uh, arguing the, the same issues over and over again. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Alderman Tresser first. To say that other cities have councils smaller than ours, we could say, well, other fire departments have more people in, per engine than ours. Um, do, we want to, do we want to go that route? Seriously. We're here to represent the people, not ourselves, not the people that wrote this back then that aren't even on the council anymore. I represent the people of Sheboygan. I think this is just a pol polite way of saying it's a bunch of poppycock. I think we can handle it. If we can handle a little bump in the road that might happen by passing this ordinance, then we don't deserve to be here anyway. Thank you. Alderman, Bel Alderman Jose first and then Alderman Belcher. Uh I have confidence in the I have confidence in the city clerk's office that they can handle anything that has to be done, and I disagree. We should wait because if we really need the 60 days right now, we have 86, and if we if we delay and wait, we're pushing ourselves too close to where we won't be able to do it. So I'm in, I'm going to be voting to uh, for the resolution to um, change it back to 16 openly. Thank you, Alderman Belger. Um, I, I would just like the city attorney to address um, Alderman. Jose's um, math question. Okay, thank you. Attorney Adams. His math is correct for one half of it, but he forgot about the rest of what I said, which is if you now get uh, uh, people who send in a verified petition, now that gets put on the ballot. It gets put on the ballot in April, the same time that people are running for election. You can't do that. So conceivably, you could just sort of hope and pray that nobody objects to it, uh, in which case you'll probably be okay. Um, the better way to do it, of course, is you can pass a better charter ordinance that actually deals with the issues rather than passing a flawed one, I guess is the way I would put it. I have a question for you. Okay. Um, how hard would it be for someone that's running for one year know that if this thing passes, it's going to be a two-year term? To me, that's it's easy. It it's may be not easy, a problem. But it's not legal. We can't do it. Well, how can we cut down the size of council without? Uh, the people having a voice in this. And don't tell me that nobody passed a petition because I don't know where it was advertised, but just like this survey that the city just did, we got 700 people that returned the survey or that answered the survey out of 49,000. So how many really paid attention to what was going on? That's not I, a legal question, so I can't answer that. You can't answer that. So I'm saying we pass the ordinance tonight and let the people have a voice in what's going on. Thank you. Alderman I mean, that's just the way it is. Alderman Sard. I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. You said don't pass at this charter because there's a better way to write the charter. What is the better, what is, what can we do that's you, legal? You accept that the time has passed for the next set of elections so that you're going to be in electing a set of aldermen who are in office for one year and you create a charter ordinance that acknowledges that, retains the number at 16 and determines how that gets divided up 
after the, after the next election. So you will have in 2018-16 aldermen up for election, half of them for one-year terms, half of them for two-year terms. That's, that's how you do it, and it's really the only legal way to do it. Why wasn't that suggested to the people that drew up this in the first place? Well, I indicated that there was a problem with the timing and, you know. But was it explained fully at that time? It was. Thank you very much. Alderman Jose. I think it's worth, I think it's worth the risk to see whether anybody's, I don't think anybody's going to object and put forth a petition. I think people, I, I think the citizens of Sheboygan like it with 16 people, and I just don't think that's going to happen. Um, there, there are other remedies. Once again, I think you're coming forth with a scare tactic. Now it's not on money, it's on how the elections are run. People die and special elections are held. There, there, are, there are ways around everything and we can, we, we, we can hold a special election if that's what's necessary to, to remedy the situation. But I, you're, you're, you're talking about maybes. Maybe if we do this, somebody will object to to uh, not going down from 16 aldermen to 10. Thank you. Is there any uh, alderman Bellinger? What is a petition? How many people have to sign it? It's a percentage of the. Uh, I don't remember the exact number, but it's a percentage of the vote at the last gubernatorial election. It's not a small number. It's not like. So it's a gubernatorial election. So it's a it's a high turnout it's election. Like, yeah, it's seven percent or something of the people who voted in the last gubernatorial election. Okay. Alderman Lassard first. If we pass this tonight or today, and, there, and we ha go through the time frame and there is no objections to going from 16 to, or from 10 back to 16, are we legal then? Two points. First of all, you won't be passing it tonight. Tonight you will simply be re recommending it to council. If a two-thirds majority vote of the council approves it in September and no one objects and no one takes out papers, because again, there's a difference between taking out papers and actually getting signatures. We, you, know, you can already take out papers for aldermen, for mayor. Uh, that's already happened. Um, I, I'm not aware of any aldermen. Uh, but... Uh, if someone actually takes out papers, you conceivably have a problem because they've taken out papers for a one-year term. Is it as great a problem as if we have um, a objection via uh, petitions? No, it's not as great of a problem. Uh, but as your attorney, I think I have to tell you, you have to do things right. Rather than um, let's just do it and then fix the problem if we get it, I, I would prefer that you do things right the first time around. Thank you. Alderman Jose. You're, it's almost a statistical impossibility. Almost never is the, the amount of signatures required. If it's 15% or whatever of the last gubernatorial race, that almost never happens. They tried it against Judge Anderson 30 some years ago when he, he voted in favor of the Muth Company and against the people that didn't like the smell around it. They tried to recall him, couldn't get enough signatures. In the last couple of years, somebody tried to do that, couldn't get enough signatures. Statistically, it, I think about 90% of the time, um, that fails. I mean, the people that are opposing the Aurora Medical Center, I think they tried and couldn't get enough signatures. It's almost never, it's, it's you got about a one in 10 shot of somebody um, get, getting enough signatures to equal that percentage of the gubernatorial race. And on this issue especially, like I say, I believe that the, that the, the people in this community favor 16 aldermen, be able, able to get a hold of an alderman, than reducing the number of aldermen by six. I can't speak to percentages, but only locally. The percentage is lower for this than some of the ones that you uh, refer to. Uh, the, most, the most similar situation were um, a number of decades ago, uh, some attempts to uh, make certain positions, including the city attorney's office, non-elected positions in which there were successful petition drives. Thank you. Um, Alderman Um I don't know if this would be in, in terms of, of closing up the discussion. Just a few points from, from my perspective. I do want to thank Alderman Bitters for pointing out that we didn't do this in secret. We didn't hide it. 
Sadly, people are not particularly interested, is my perception as to whether there are 16 or 10 of us. Um, I don't think uh, our constituents live or die by that. I could be wrong, but uh, I certainly had zero interest from any constituents about the vote that we took 12 to 4 last November. Remember that if you change this now and you rely on it now, and in a year from now there are different people sitting around, your action can be undone as well. There is some respect for precedent. I'm not saying it has to be controlling, but I think before you overturn a 12 to 4 vote that was taken a mere eight months ago, we should give long, hard thought to what was brought to the table at that time, what was discussed at that time. Because if serious charter ordinances can be flipped every single year, that's not a good thing for the city in terms of government and reliability. Um, Fond du Lac, which is a little smaller than Sheboygan, has seven <coughs> alders. Oshkosh, which I think is 10 to 15,000 um, uh, uh, citizens more, uh, has seven alders. Manitowoc, which is somewhat smaller, uh, has 10. Appleton is the outlier at 15. They do have 25,000 more people than we do. They also used to have the largest county board in the state. They had remarkably 48 people on their county board. It's been reduced somewhat. Uh, it appears out of Gamey County likes to uh, have a lot of people around. Here are the advantages to remaining with the ordinance as we have it now. First of all, we will have con uh, consistent districts and wards. The plan is to follow the county supervisory districts so that there won't be city districts and county districts. So when you ask, a you know, when you ask your friends, do you know who your county board supervisor is, your alderman, that person will be able to respond because it'll be in the same district. Um, we've talked about, several alders have talked about, uh, you know, by and of and for the people. Here's the problem with having two alders per district is our votes can cancel each other out. It's like the tragic husband and wife who can't agree on who to elect for president. They both vote the way they want to, it's good, but it has a net zero effect. Now, this doesn't come up all that often, although in my particular circumstance in District 4, our constituents don't really have a vote because the two alders in, in our district are fairly consistently voting different ways. So in District 4, on a number of issues, there's a zero net effect because we have people voting against each other. I mean, that's just one of the weird inbuilt problems with having two people in one district. Why do we have two people? You'll remember city historian Bill Wangeman talking about the fact that we had these wards and there was an alder for each ward and every night it was the alder's duty to light the gas lamps. And that's why we have an alder for each ward or now two alders per district. Also, crimes were reported to the alders instead of to the police, and then the alders went to the police. Sounds a little old-fashioned, but that's the reason we have 16 of us. I find just an inbuilt confusion in terms of constituent services. For a number of years, my first four years on the council, um, I had a fellow alder who, from what I could determine, never responded to constituents. So I knew when someone was calling me, I was the first phone call, and I would be the person dealing with that issue. I, would, I didn't have to figure out whether the other alder was involved or whether we were giving conflicting advice or sending people in different directions. Um, that is not the case now. My fellow alder, I think, is very responsive to constituent claims, but we don't know who's done what, where, and how. So sometimes in calling your, your alder, you don't know which one to call. And I've had people say, I don't know who to call, but I called you, and that's fine. If there's one alder per district, that's completely clear. That alder is responsible not only for lighting the gas lamps, but also for responding to constituent uh, requests in, in a timely fashion. In other words, staying at 10 gives people more representation rather than less, and we need to think about it in, in that respect. Now, our committee restructuring subcommittee has worked very hard 
to present, and I should actually say our city administrator who did most of the work, um, has worked hard to figure out how do you do this, because it is a reduction. How, how do you do this and make sure that everything gets done efficiently? Um, what you had before you in your materials um, is our proposal. It is a proposal, it is just a proposal. Things can be changed in different ways. I would suggest when there are 10 of us, we'll have a much better sense of how things are going. We need to be very careful about crying about quorums because it is our job to come to these meetings and be present. And when we decide to run for Alder, we do that knowing that it is going to make a demand on our time and that we're getting paid for it. Not a lot, but we're getting paid. I figure at about 20 hours of service per, per month, some of us do more, some of us do less, that's about $18 an hour. So we are getting paid and we need to appear at committee meetings, we need to respond to constituent calls and the like. That, the particular model that we have suggested can be changed, it can be tweaked, it, you know, we can, go to, I, we can go to five members, five alders per standing committee when, once we unite them. Our idea is, is that a lot of things that alders do are things that staff ought to be doing. There's a lot of footwork that's, that staff members can do so that law and licensing and public protection and safety in particular, but also other places, those meetings can be more efficiently done. Alders can, can focus on the policy things that we're here for, not for, not the sort of quasi-judicial deciding on individual cases. So we can make these committees work smarter and more efficiently. And here's my final point, and I know you're glad. Um, here's the deal. If we're not willing to change, we can't ask our department heads to. There is not a department head in this city that has not looked hard and long at how his or her department does business, how they can be more efficient, how they can service constituents better, how they can get more bang for the buck, if you will. And each and every department, at least as far as I know, has taken major reorganizational steps in order to make sure that our tax dollars are used more efficiently. This is a way for this council to act more efficiently in the interests, not in the disinterest, in the interests of our constituents. And if we can't do that, then I don't see how we are able to ask our department heads and our departments to do the same thing. I'm asking you to honor the vote that was taken 12 to 4 eight months ago. Thank you. Alderman Jose. Um, I, I only had one point, but now I have, I have two in the last 30 seconds. Um, if crunching only $2,700 is going to be saved by eliminating six aldermen, I was on the Department of Public Works Committee last year. If somebody slides on the ice and knocks down a street pole, that's $2,700. I mean, that's, that's nothing in, in terms, I don't think it's one-tenth of one percent of the city budget, $2,700. But that's not the point I want to make. The point I want to make, less representation is never better. Saying that they cancel each other, that's a good thing. Do you realize that we would have, Tammy Baldwin would be the voice for the state of Wisconsin if there was only one U.S. senator? How awful would that be, Tammy Baldwin being the okay, only okay, okay. voice? Let's, let's keep to the subject here. Okay. Well, that's All part right. of the subject. She's talking about two, one being better and two, it's not. Less representation is never better. This country would not exist if there were not two U.S. senators per state. Rhode Island and Virginia and a few other smaller states were not going to get on board. They were not going to get on board without a Freemason by the name of Benjamin Franklin authori uh, authoring the Great Compromise, and because there were two senators for every state, not one, two, that got the, the, the Constitution signed and got this country formed. Okay, thank you very much. Alderman Tresser, then Alderman Belger. Sometimes I feel like I'm in a courtroom and I'll just listen to closing statements. I'm not a jury. I'm a member of this council. I work to serve the people. And I feel with all my heart, probably as strongly as Alderman Donahue feels in her position, that we should stay at 16. Just because there is one strong opinion in one way doesn't mean that we all have to be like sheep and follow. 
and I, for one, am going to vote for 16. Thank you very much. Alderman Bellinger. Um, I just have a, a procedural question. I'm wondering the changes of the committee structure. That was a subset of the strategic fiscal planning meeting or committee. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that flow back through there? For I mean, how, how do these? How are we to approve these proposed changes, or are they just as is? And they're. I'm, I'm just shouldn't it go back through strategic fiscal and then come back out that way? Seeing as how it went, that's the way it was created. I'm. I believe kidding. we would have to go back to the committee and then they would make the recommendations to the council. Well, there was a specific resolution that created this subcommittee and I believe we have until September 30th to present a report and that would be in the form of a resolution to the, to the council as a whole. I don't think that there's a, a re-referral to strategic fiscal. I think it, it, it's a freestanding committee that, that goes back to council then. Okay. I'll have to look at the ordinance again but I think that's how it's done. Okay. Are there any other? Alderman Lassard. I think just in listening to the to different people speak, I'm I'm changing my vote from 10 back to 16 because I've sat on the council. This is my fifth year, and not everybody comes to the meeting. I know it. Everyone else knows it. You count on one person and they don't show up. What are you going to do about it? Nothing. You can't do a thing about it. That's how this is all set up. When we had older persons that had some questionable behavior, we could do nothing about it. If we have 10 aldermen and three decide not to show up and go to committee meetings, nothing you can do about it. We can't do anything about getting, we have 16 aldermen, we can't do anything about getting everyone to come to the meetings as it stands right now. So I think that the possibility to have our constituents be able to reach 16 people is better than to reach 10 and I don't feel I feel I truly made an error when I voted the way that I did to reduce the council I, I just think there's just a small group that it's a, like a control thing and I'm just I'm just not in favor of it thank you very much Alderman Ludowski I just want to say that I think 16 aldermen is a lot better than 10 also getting back to the city attorney and people could bring up a, a petition to block this if they don't like it. The required number of votes on the, or signatures on a petition would be over a thousand. I'm not sure how many exactly, but I do know that it's over a thousand. And I think everybody in this room knows how difficult it is to get anybody to run for aldermen when they only need 20 signatures. So a group trying to get a thousand, I don't think they're even going to try. Thank you very much. Alderman Thiel, then Alderman Rob. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I am in favor, obviously, of, of keeping it at the 16 because I feel I did make a mistake also. But I do believe I, I want to do things legally also. Um, I did not hear Chuck Adams' response to that in the committee because I wasn't there, so I appreciate it. So as much as I do want to keep it at 16, I think we do need to do it correctly also. Um, so it might be hard for me to vote for it today, but definitely in the future when we can do it the right way, it does have my vote. Thank you. Alderman Rob. We talk about um, what other cities are doing and what their numbers are. I think what we have to do is focus on Sheboygan. We have a lot of great things happening, and I think the only reason why that's happening is because we work together well as a team. If we reduce it to 10, you're going to have less team members and less coverage overall. And as a matter of fact, just to point, just to point out, while we're sitting here in the last 45 minutes, I've had three people contact me from my district, and I can just see the messages come up. So it, it, you know, it does work. And if you have two people per district, we can share those things right now. So I think we keep it at 16. Okay. Thank you very much. Just, just to be clear, okay. a yes vote is to pass it to go back to 16, right? A yes vote would be to make the recommendation that it's going to go to the Common Council with a favorable recommendation, okay? Um, seeing no other uh, discussion, um, I'll entertain a vote. Yes. Roll call. Bellinger? Nay. 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 Daniel? No. Strong? Nay. Aye. Herman? Aye. Jose? 
Thank you very much. Okay, then we're going to go to uh, item 2 2 on the agenda from Public Protection and Safety to whom was referred to RO number 791617 by the fire chiefs submitting the following a letter from Chase Longmiller, president of the Sheboygan Firefighters Local 483, a letter from the Inter International Association of Firefighters. The economic impact of the successful uh, commercial fire invent, um, intervention. For the Phoenix Fire Department, August or June, August 2012, geographic information, systems, energy, uh, emergency service response capabilities, analysis, final report of the Fire Sheboygan Fire Department, dated June 16, 2016. Please, Chase. Take as much time as you want. Thank you. Is this TV just on automatically? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Good evening. Hello. Uh, my name is Chase Longmiller, uh, President of Sheboygan Firefighters, Local 483. Um, alongside me, I have uh, Executive Board Member of Local 483, Brendan Hughes. We have a brief little uh, slide presentation. I know you guys, we gave you a lot of material to go over over the last month. Um, I'm not going to take up all your time tonight. We could spend hours going through this study, but tonight we're just going to go through a set of topics that we want to hit a couple bullet points and then answer any questions that you guys may have had after reading our study, and if any of you have any questions of the fire chief. Okay. Um, so tonight, uh, we're gonna, what we'd like to talk about is some of the staffing deficiencies that we feel are occurring within the fire department, uh, the findings that we uh, feel are most important that came out of our study, some recommendations that Local 43 would like to put forth, and we'll take any questions. I've already introduced myself and uh, Cal Hughes here. Um, I got a little background on why we did the study. Primarily, the study was uh, came after we didn't get the three uh, members that we <coughs> lost at the beginning of this year. We lost an additional three uh, firefighters after the last budget that were taken out, and that's what kind of started the process to us to look forward and get some take the data that the department has and send it to somebody who could put it into a form that could either show where our deficiencies were, where we're lacking, and prove <laughs> what we've been saying all along, that we need some more people to help us out. So with that, when we talk about our staffing deficiencies, we'll just cover a few things. Just, in, uh, just since 2010, we've lost nine members of the fire department. And again, we lost those three at the beginning of two, 2016. Uh, what this has really <coughs> resulted in, and that's why we're gonna, what we're going to focus on here tonight, is the fact that we're running most of our engine companies, most of all, all of our fire companies, engines and our truck companies, with two personnel on a daily basis. That means two, guy, two members are always on those engines. And that's where we're going to focus on tonight and kind of show you where that deficiency and what the study had to say about it. Another problem that we need to bring up that we feel is causing to the loss of uh, people on the street is the current battalion chief schedule. And this schedule right now, to give a little background, and it may not have been in the, your study packet as much, but we'll take any questions, and I'm sure the chief will as well. We act up into the battalion chief role almost half the year as of right now. We take a member off our line to fill the current schedule of the chiefs, uh, which is that, that position is there to pretty much lead the city. Uh, they're in charge of all five stations. And over 50, about 50% 50 of the time we are acting in that capacity. One of our officers 
is put in that role, therefore reducing one of our trucks and one of our engine companies who are out there doing the services. Uh, you know, when we talk about that battalion chief schedule, that is pretty much unheard of anywhere in the state of Wisconsin. And I know I just listened where we don't want to compare ourselves to cities, and I heard that. But when it comes to firefighting, there's a reason things have been done certain ways. And having one person that we have on a regular basis is very important for leadership. Uh, for anybody here who's been in the service, having that officer, having that leadership is very important as you uh, do anything, especially in our organization as a quasi-military unit. So, and I'll, one other last thing I'd like to say on the BC thing before I move on to the battalion chief, and I may re uh, refer to it as uh, BC, is that it's created a huge disconnect between the men, the people on the line, the labor, and our management team. I started back in 1997. Uh, back then we had our 24-hour battalion chiefs, and they were always our in-between, our go-between, between the guys on the line and, our, and the bosses up in the front office. They're the ones we could go to with our issues. They would come back, they would go to the stations on a regular daily basis, travel around the city. How are you guys doing? What can we do? What's broken? What needs to get fixed today? Do you have any concerns? What can I answer? Are there rumors out there that we need to squash? And losing that has been a huge problem. And I, I'm sure that Chief Romas, we've talked about it many times in his office, as he was a former battalion chief in Milwaukee, and he knows that connection between the line personnel and the management. Uh, when we get into the study here, I'm going to kind of let Cal uh, say a few words here because uh, Cal did a primarily all the uh, submission of all the information from our department working with our management. So, Cal, if you want to talk a little bit about the staffing findings or the study findings. Sure. Uh, again, hi, Cal. In case anybody didn't know. Uh, when we contacted uh, the uh, IFF to do this study, I would like to build off of what Chase said. Uh, it was not just when we lost the three people. We actually uh, uh, started looking into this process when the proposal uh, to lose a station, to uh, convert from a five-station fire department to a four-station fire department. And like, I, like we said in the cover letter to you, we weren't initially opposed to it, but we were curious as to what that would do to response times. Uh, one of the things that I believe Chief Romas has always been proud of with us is our uh, response times and our response capabilities. Uh, we have very low, unheard of staffing levels uh, across the city, uh, across like cities, uh, across NFPA standards. We're at about half of what we should be according to NFPA standards. So having that fast response, that fast capability is sort of integral to the process of our firefighting. And by taking that and diminishing it, uh, you're taking, you're, you're compounding the problem of bad staffing, and then we would now have bad timing to go along with it. So that was another thing that we looked at. And uh, w when you look in your packet, you'll see uh, what the study findings were. We do have some additional mapping that goes out and talks to how many stations should be in a city like with the layout. It's unique to every city, so they have a computer modeling program that actually goes through it. And I would get, I would get lost as you would following my tangent if I just kept on going that way. Uh, the NFPA 1710 standards uh, for crew size, uh, the minimum number of firefighters in a structure and the 202 risk, uh, as this says, the minimum crew per NFPA after they've done uh, extensive research with uh, the NIST <coughs> uh, which is the National Institute for Safety and Technology, I believe. I hope I got that right. Uh, along with the uh, uh, iChiefs, which is the Chiefs Organization, the International Firefighters Organization, and other organizations out there that do these kinds of studies. NIOSH, I believe, is another one. Uh, if, if it's an acronym and it's in the federal government and it has to do with safety, they help study this thing. Uh, they found that the optimum crew size for a fire department for a uh, for an engine company or a truck company is four. Uh, and that uh, 15 for a uh, small or low risk fire was also the minimum. Uh, the SFD does not manage to meet this requirement with current staffing despite having 16 uh, people on per day. Uh, I dug through the numbers last year and looked at all of our, uh, 
all of our responses, uh, all of our responses to structure fires, and found that uh, two times out of, I can't remember how many it was, but only two times, which turned out to be 7% uh, of the time, now minimum is 90, uh, according to NFPA, but 7% of the time, uh, we were getting 15 firefighters on scene uh, within that eight minute time period. And uh, both of those fires happened to be, we had uh, three engine companies with three people on there that day, uh, for both of those. We did have one outlier that did not meet that, that did have three firefighters on, but it looked, and I would have to go back and listen to the tape, but it looked like there was a dispatching error uh, just by the way the rigs were staggered out as far as their dispatching goes. So I, I did not do that. I apologize for not researching that. But it did look like it was the outlier. So really what I guess I'm saying is, is that we only meet the standard by NFPA when we have more people on the streets. Uh, this slide just uh, talks about the NFPA, I essentially said all that stuff. Uh, crew size and the effect on the fire attack, uh, time study. Uh, what I did was uh, we also went through and uh, we sort of modeled some of the things that we did when we did it locally, not just relying on the NIST studies. But we did a time to task survey uh, from our department, within our department. And what it found was that on average that a split crew of two and two, which is uh, two firefighters on an ambulance, two firefighters on an engine or a truck company, that it took a minute and 35, uh, one minute and 35 seconds longer to perform the task of deploying a hose to the front door of a structure. So when we had four people on the engine company, it took a, min uh, it took a minute 35 less to have that hose to the door. Now along with that, we also not only pulled the hose to the door, but we also connected that truck to the, uh, uh, to the fire hydrant. So you had a ready source of water, you had two people ready to go in the fire, and you had two people outside of the fire, which is, meets all of the standards that, that we would ever be able to talk about. Uh, so that minute 35, as we'll show you in, uh, in one of the slides forthcoming, uh, is a, a very important amount of time. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I, I kind of glossed over it, which is my poor communication, but it also found that uh, the communication deteriorated with a, a split crew. Essentially, when you have, uh, you know, two, or when you have two people on a rig, uh, when we have two people on an engine company, you have an officer and you have a, a driver. Their tasks are pretty much delegated once they get onto a scene. They know, the officer knows that he's going to be doing a size up, he's going to be looking at everything, he's going to be talking, making sure that uh, uh, citizens are out, if they're not out, where they are, giving and ordering different tasks to next incoming fire, uh, fire apparatus and fire officers. Uh, so they know what they're going to do. Uh, the problem was, was that they didn't have time to talk about what the other two guys were going to do, especially once they got on scene. So scenes are dynamic. They, they change. They're not all the same. Uh, an officer may, not, may or may not choose to have a certain tactic at one fire versus the other. So when you had two guys that are parking about 150 to 250 feet away, uh, having to get out, get their air packs on, walk up, uh, that officer could be lost and those guys won't really have any idea right away as to what the tactic is going to be when they roll up on scene. It's, it, it's sort of a secondary thing, but it, does, it is important and it does, uh, it does deteriorate the crew and the, crew is, the crew's integrity. So There's no real time. I never, it's hard to quantify that time, so I didn't. So when, when Cal has been talking about FBA and we talk about the 15 personnel on scene in the first eight minutes, that right there per NFPA, the standard is a 2,000 square foot single story residence, no basement, <coughs> no exposure. So when you hear that standard and you hear about what kind of house that they've decided, <coughs> there is not many houses like that that you're going to find in the city of Sheboygan. Everybody almost has a basement. And to find a single story and no exposures. And we're going to show you some slides of some, some pictures here. And I, want, I know everybody here knows what Sheboygan looks like in their homes, but we wanted to just give you an idea of truly when we talk about exposures, what we're looking at. So I took this picture today on 8th Street. Those are about three, three foot exposures, three foot paths in between those houses, maybe a little narrower on one side or the other. 
if one of those houses goes up, that's where it says we're having 15 people for a house with no exposure. That house has got exposure. <coughs> Both of those houses on either side right there are definitely in danger of starting on fire through direct, either direct flame contact, convection, whatever way the fire is going to travel to that, to that next home. And to prevent that, we're going to need additional people to put up more lines to spray water to make sure that those two homes are not lost. Here, this house has got, is a newer home, which we don't have many, you know, we have some newer home subdivisions in our city, but this isn't as prevalent with the big 15, 20, 30 foot uh, setbacks between the homes where you're not going to have any sort of fire impingement if there's a house fire right there. And this is, uh, this is where I wanted to show you the exposure issue. Here's uh, Oakland Avenue. As you probably know, we've seen a rash of fires just in the last week. Uh, I ended up at this fire, get a call in on Friday morning before I had to come in. And this was uh, Oakland Avenue. And as you see up on the, the left, you'll see a garage that's standing. And then on the right, you see a house. But what you don't see is in the middle, there was another garage, which is gone. So when we talk about exposures, that's how quickly that fire moved from the first call that they got. And when I do believe when the officers came, I believe SPD was there first, you know, there was already fire on the outside, but that's how quickly it moves. So when we talk about exposures and the need to have enough people there quickly to prevent that to continue to roll down the street or roll from garage to garage in some of these neighborhoods where we don't have the new city code setbacks that we have in new subdivisions. Some of the other challenges that we'll just bring up quickly that were in your uh, study packet that while, uh, you know, these are some things that, you know, no matter what, unless you're a very large city, it's going to be hard to meet. But when we talk about high rises, we have a lot of commercial structure, assisted living facilities. Each one of these kind of facilities need additional people, and they need them quickly. They need them within that eight minutes as that fire is progressing. Now, most of some of these are going to be sprinklered and are going to have fire prevention measures in place to help slow down that fire. But it always does, it, as you've seen in history, it doesn't always work. Sprinklers can, be, can get overcome and we need to hook up and also boost that pressure system. And one of the, one of the other things that we found and you saw in your packet from the University of Arizona study was the fact about economic loss. You know, when we think about a single family residence burning down, <coughs> The economic loss is really, that family took a, a really huge economic loss. They took a real hit to them. But they may, with insurance, be able to rebuild there. Now downtown, we've seen homes that we've lost in the downtown area, and it's hard to rebuild downtown because new codes prevent us from building new homes down there. There's another tax, uh, a little bit of taxes that are off the tax roll. But when you lose a big commercial structure or you have a big commercial fire, you don't know if that company is going to rebuild. You don't know what they're going to do. They could be gone. And those economic losses can have serious impact when it pertains to your city and your tax base. Just quickly to go over the NFPA on high rises, take Wasserman. Um, I'm very familiar. I work out of Engine 1 right in the alley here, so I'm there a lot. Uh, you know, eight floors. I've been to multiple fires at that place. And uh, I remember a fire just 10 years ago, and I probably had 20 people wandering around smoke-filled structure trying to get out, and there was about six of us trying to shuttle people out of there and having one or two people trying to put uh, water on the fire. But right there, NFPA 1710 states, you need 43 people within eight minutes to protect that building and to, to actually start working to evacuate that kind of building. Commercial, same thing, 43 firefighters. We have a brand new beautiful building down there at Acuity. You know, they're an insurance company, but I know that they, and they've done a really good job with their fire prevention. I've seen that, you know, with all their new sprinklers, and they've done a great job. So they're well protected, but even well protected buildings need proper fire support. Assisted living, NFPA says you need 26 firefighters minimum with eight minutes. Uh, this is the Eisner, up by Eisner there. This, uh, we have many of these facilities within the community who would need quick response of firefighters. Now we got a little chart up here. I'm going to let Cal talk a little bit about this, and then we'll show a video to kind of correspond what we're trying to get at with the fire tap. Uh, you know, this was uh, this was in uh, these were part of the findings that uh, the NIST had uh, when they did the uh, NIOSH report. Uh, 
when they looked at uh, four firefighter companies, three firefighter companies, two firefighter companies, they also looked at, which is not listed on here, but five and six uh, company uh, personnel companies. Uh, the gains that you had on five and six were pretty low, uh, but they still do uh, the, uh, you know, we, we talked about, the only reason we really talked about uh, high rises, just to remember that there are those buildings there, but the NFPA doesn't make any distinction between a high rise property uh, which is a high risk property and uh, a building the size of like NEMAC. Uh, they don't make any distinction because essentially you're taking a high rise and you're putting it on its side. It's just a giant building. So that's why they don't make a distinction, which is kind of one of the reasons we brought that up. But they do in larger high rise districts, uh, you know, again, your, Milwa your Milwaukee's, your Chicago's, not your Sheboygan's, but they do have five and six recommendations for, uh, for personnel companies. So four isn't the only one that they have. But when we looked at four, when they looked at four firefighters and they did time to task surveys on it, uh, as you can see, they found that uh, advancing an attack line took about 327, which uh, I didn't even remember that, that this existed because uh, this would have made my job in that, that uh, uh, survey that I told you about before, that time to test survey, a lot easier. And as you can see, when it goes from uh, four down to two, uh, they are kind of similar. I mean, it's a minute 26 on their survey, and it was a minute 35 for us. So it does make a difference. Uh, you'll see uh, three firefighter companies and four firefighter companies are much more efficient <coughs> at some of the things that need to be done immediately once you, once you get on scene. Now, we talk about having 15 people within eight minutes. That's nice. Yes, we, that's true. We do need at least that on small structures that are small, low risk. On larger, on larger more medium risk structures, uh, again, uh, a medium risk would be more of the same small structure, so your same single family house, now wedged in between two buildings, that have, like, like that slide we showed you, that becomes now sort of a medium risk building because your risk now is to fire extension and conflagration, which on a small scale, which is exactly what we had on Oakland, a very small scale, but it was a conflagration. It went from one building to another building to another building. You know, the only through the efforts of, of, of good tactics and quick water were those buildings gone out, but as far as I know, at least Two of them are probably total losses, if not all three of them, um, which is bad. We don't want that to happen. We want quicker responses. We want better, more efficient responses. And as you can see, this, graph, this graphic shows you how much more efficient more people staffed correctly can lead towards uh, uh, efficiencies. So what I'd like to do is, I'm going to pull up a quick, if you wouldn't mind when it comes up, I don't know how, how it'll come up with yeah. the internet. If this video ends up playing, uh, if it doesn't, I'll send a link to your email. But what it is, is it's a, a UL NIST study, and it compares uh, two, ho two uh, model homes that are built. One with uh, legacy furniture, a lot like the, ne the desks and uh, hardwood furniture that are in this room. And you'll see on the right is modern furnishings. That's the, the, gas of ca the can of gasoline that we all sit on at night on our, our couches and our nice chairs and our beds. That's all based out of oil, oil-based products. And if you'll see, I don't know where we're at, but we're at two minutes already since the time they started it. Two minutes is probably when they're getting, when that first smoke detector, maybe a little bit before, has gone off and they've made their first call to 911. Now remember, we, got, we have 80 seconds to get from wherever we are in the station to in the rig to be in route. So that's 80 seconds, it's a minute and 20, and then we have to be on scene within that four minutes. But as you can see, and I'll have Cal just speed it up, maybe to, there we're at three minutes. Survivability in that room is going way down on the one on the right. And it's amazing when you look at this video, when you think about the products of yesteryear, how hardy they were to fire. And if you wouldn't mind, Cal, let's just jump up to, uh, is it three? Look at 342. From the time that started, and now we'll look at at our fire over at the legacy at the legacy furnishings. I mean, that's still a tenable room right there. People are still moving around, but you're not moving around in in uh, modern. That's flashed over. Everything in that room has now hit its ignition point and has flashed over. Um, and that's 
that's gonna, it's tough. Every fire department faces that now, and the, the, the key to our firefighting with, that kind of, with those kind of products is to make sure that if that's in one room, we're arriving on scene to keep that to a one-bedroom fire, a living room fire, so that the rest of the house or the rest of the bedrooms where people are just getting, you know, hearing the smoke alarms are upstairs, they are taking the task to shut their doors, and we can go up there and uh, effectively rescue them and, uh, and put the fire out simultane simultaneously. And that's the key. We want to rescue, and we want to put that fire out because the best way to rescue people is to be putting the fire out. And it, it's, it's, it's just, when you look at it, you'll see that's the best way to do it because that fire is going to keep going if you leave it unchecked. I know there's always a lot of talk when it comes to the council about EMS, fire-based EMS. Um, and while we didn't really, we didn't talk a lot about it in our study, we did want to bring it up tonight. And it's just about the importance of people. People, it, it's, the, it's the firefighters and the amount of people what it takes to do a job. And when you go to the ER, you don't show up and just have one or two nurses working on you. When you call 911 and you're sick and you're hurt, it's nice to have four or five people show up to get you out. If that means two of our paramedics plus an officer or another paramedic are working on the patient in the house and two guys are outside in the middle of winter shoveling the driveway so we can get the cot out or doing those kind of things or making sure that we balance the cot so that no patient falls, uh, carrying bags to effectively get the uh, patient to the hospital in a quicker situation. It's all about people. People, and, I, and we know people are expensive. I mean, it, it's true. I mean, you guys have to make those judgments, and that's what the budget's uh, set forth. But I can give you a quick instance just yesterday. When I worked yesterday, I had 12 calls out of that station yesterday, and uh, we had a code, and two guys, myself and my driver, showed up, and a gentleman uh, had a heart attack in his car, and 250, 270, and it was all we could do just to pull him out of the car by ourselves just to get him on the ground in a parking lot to start CPR. And then our paramedics arrived on scene coming from the fire. Uh, the four of us, we left the engine, and four of us, it took three of us in the back of the ambulance to work on the patient and one to drive. And I'm happy to find out that he actually we got a heartbeat back, and I believe he's at a hospital in Milwaukee as of today. So uh, hopefully everything goes well. But I mean, I just, I guess what I'm trying to get through is it's people needed to perform those immediate, right on the spot, uh, functions to ensure life safety and property conservation. So, yeah, you get the next slide. Yep. We we've come up with a few recommendations that we believe uh, will get us started. We understand that, and and I guess uh, I like to think I know probably just as well as anybody in the department of where we've been. I've been on the executive board for 16 years doing contracts. I've sat before uh, different members of council, uh, the mayor, different HR directors, uh, tweaking our contracts so that we wouldn't lose people over the years because we knew how important it was to have the people on the streets. And that, to us, was one of the biggest things. However, when we talk about people, right now, ladder four and ladder five, your north side, far north side and your far south side ladder companies, where there's no ambulance in those stations, are staffed on a daily basis with only two people. There's only two people in those stations. And I can tell you, I live on the far north side. I know there's uh, some people in this room who live on the far south side. Your first rig that's coming into that, that your home is coming with two people. And they need an, an additional person on that truck to help perform and get that line to that front door if there's a fire. I mean, in Station 5's area on the south side, we've, they were just had a multi, uh, couple of fires just in the last few days. The other immediate action that we're looking at, we would like to see our daily staffing go to 18. Right now, our daily staff is at 16. We'd like to see that go up to 18 a day. That would be those two, to have those three people on those two truck companies. Doesn't take care of having Engine 1 or the other three engines only with uh, two because they have that ambulance in the bay right now. But we'd like to have those truck companies go up to three, people, three members a day. And the other big thing would be return the battalion chiefs to that 24-hour schedule. Eliminate us having to take a body off the line and work into, that, work into that position and reducing our minimum daily staffing. 
And for down the road, we'd like to just see the department, our chiefs, create an operational plan that works to increase our daily minimum staffing of, of three personnel on every engine and every truck. Uh, I'll go ahead, Cal, if you want to just touch on this quickly. Sure. Uh, we, did, uh, we did work with uh, and develop the developed the plan. Uh, really what it was, was it was mainly a proof of concept. And the proof of concept came from uh, uh, knowing that budgets are limited and uh, seeing what it was that we could do to tweak, uh, 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 to tweak personnel from station to station where uh, the minimum number of people that would need to be added to the TO would do the most good. Uh, so we do have a couple of scenarios uh, that do increase our minimum daily staffing but they do it in a way that, uh, as you'll see when you looked in through your uh, uh, presentation that, or the uh, uh, report that we gave everybody, uh, the uh, IAFF recommendation was uh, 27 uh, minimum daily staffing, uh, which would make a for 31 overall, which would be 93 plus, uh, plus so about 100 people, and currently we have 70, 70? 70.5. 70.5. So currently we have 70. So obviously that's not a realistic scenario, and we realize that. So we worked with them, and we worked with the mapping team, and uh, we worked with some of their uh, uh, a analysts to, uh, to try to c come up with a plan that would, uh, that would do the most good for the most people while costing the least. Uh, so we do have those plans. Uh, we did have some stuff we would prefer to talk it over with the chief before we would pr uh, produce anything publicly. Um, but the plan does take into account uh, call data, response times, and community risk. Uh, it's, we, feel, we feel that they're really two bulletproof <coughs> plans. Um, but they do take a reinvestment in our department and a reinvestment in the community. So that's, uh, I know you guys have been here a while tonight, and uh, we really do appreciate the fact that you guys forward this on the committee of the whole so that we could speak to all the older persons. Um, you know, we've, we're have we pretty passionate about it. Um, as long as I've been here, uh, you know, we've done our best to continue to hold our staffing where it is. You know, I, I know the chief's been quoted that we have an incredible department, and we do. You know, our guys, you, you don't see us in the newspaper very often for fires because you know, the press and the, and the news. Typically, the fires that make it are fires that have significant, you know, value loss or are big fires. But, you know, there was a, we had a fire on Bluff Avenue on Saturday night, you know, an attic fire. You know, we have a lot of one-bedroom fires, and that's because our guys, even with the limited resources we have, um, we really work hard and we're very aggressive. We, we try to get in there and get it done as fast as we can so we can limit the damage. However, it's catching up to us because things are burning hotter, things are burning faster, and we're teetering on that level with losing these last three guys that we just can't sit back, and, and that aggressiveness is sooner or later going to get somebody hurt. Uh, so it's why we wanted to give you this study. Uh, I, I, I know that there's, some, not, there's so, always someone who, you know, some people may think, well, this came from the union, it's their union study, but I'll tell you that the group that did this out of Washington, D.C., uh, they put a lot of hard work. You know, it took over six months. Uh, something like this in this private sector would cost about seventy-five to a hundred thousand dollars. It was it was narrow. I know that we only focused on two areas, but those were the two areas that were pretty much brought up. We wanted staffing and working with the chief. He would like to, he wanted to know where the fire stations should be put. And I don't think you'll find a, a GIS system that's you know much better than what we were able to provide. And we have additional maps if you would like to see them tonight. If you have questions on that, even some greenfield mapping. So. With that, uh, we thank you for your time, and we'd be happy to answer questions from anyone tonight. Uh, Mayor, are you first, then? First of all, thank you so much for um, being here tonight. Uh, I really appreciate the business-like way that you and your union have approached the city and trying to get your point across. The uh, study that was done was, uh, you know, very complete, and... Um, while we still may consider, you know, getting some additional information, uh, you know, it gave us a real good picture of that four-station model and what the challenges are. I was wondering if you could go back to the slide with your recommendations. Sure. 
And could you give us an idea just in FTEs as to what those uh, recommendations are? You know, with your staffing schedule and everything else, it's a little different than most other, you know, shift jobs. And I was just wondering if you could, you know, tell us what those are in FTEs. You're, you're talking about full-time <coughs> equivalent yeah, for employees? Yes. Well, the first recommendation, of course, is getting those three back. So the three that we lost in 2016. Right. So that's three FTEs. Right. And then the battalion chiefs, what does that mean? So that will bring us up to 17 a day. The three would bring us at a minimum of 17. And then we would probably need to get to one more to get to our 18. But, however, if we lost the, the fact that half the year, if we didn't have to work up into the battalion chief role, we'd already be at those levels because we've lost that, that spot. Because right now, if you look at it, actually, when you look at our daily staffing, we're at 21 a day. Is that correct, chief? By contract, 21, which, 21 we have assigned per shift. By contract, which I, I think you may be going this way a little bit with benefits and that, we're allowed up to four firefighters off a day. We can have up to four off a day. So that puts us at 17 a day right there. So with our getting our three back, w at our four off a day would put us at 18. So you'd be back there just with those three. Now that doesn't take into effect, of course, when we have somebody on sick leave or if we act up into the battalion chief. But just like any other profession, and when I first started, uh, you know, you, when someone calls in sick, sometimes even in hospitals and everywhere else that has service jobs, somebody else is typically called in to fill that role. Uh, our fire department over the last, since I've been here in 20 years, has done very well, I believe, when it comes to sick leave, uh, workers' comp, if Sandy, were, if uh, HR Director Rourke was here, I think she would reaffirm that. This year was a little different. We had some on-duty injuries that were a little long-standing. However, uh, our guys have prided themselves of, A, staying physically fit, taking care of themselves, and they love coming to work, uh, so we don't see that. But I believe, and if my math is right, if we got our three guys back up to 66, which puts us at 22 a day, minus four, if you had up to four guys on leave that day for their vacations so they could get their vacations in for the year, uh, that would put us at 18 a day, which would accomplish those truck companies on the north and south side immediately going back to three personnel. Now, on the battalion chiefs, are we looking at adding any other battalion chiefs, or is that just changing it to a 24-hour schedule? That's just taking them from their hybrid schedule that was created four or five years ago by Chief Herman and moving them back to the 24-hour shift schedule. Uh, any additional personnel in front office, that, that's not coming from, from me. And then, um, you know, you talked a little bit about the vacation schedule, and that's a union contract issue. Is that something that uh, we might be able to develop a memorandum of understanding on and possibly uh, look at any changes there? Yeah, I don't think this would be the time and place to start talking contract. That's uh, just not our place to go there. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to go there, but there are logistics that go in that with when the amount of people you have and the amount of time that people have to take their own vacation – uh, you severely limit their ability to take off if you reduce the amount of people off on a day, just like any other body, uh, any other job that you work on your private day, uh, if they limited the amount of people off. So uh, as far as a contract negotiating, we're not even in negotiation, so it wouldn't be something we'd talk about, but in the future, uh, I'm sure we'll discuss it. Thank you very much. Al Alderman Donahue and Lewandowski. Um, and just... We all got our, our big three-ring binders, and, and I know, and I want to thank you guys. This is an excellent presentation, um, and Chase and Cal already know this, but the proposed budget from the chief administrative officer, chief administrator, um, uh, does fold three firefighters and a battalion chief into the budget. So I think we have... We didn't know that, but oh, I'm uh, glad to hear that. Oh, I... I <laughs> well, you. and you do Find now. Um, and I... And just as you're, you know, starting to review just to, to ensure, and it is our hope because those, those national fire protection safety standards are important, and we can get there. We need your help. We need that contract reopened. We need to talk about vacation times. So it's my hope that with our show of good faith and your show of good faith that we really can meet those standards and, and, and have a really good result here so that, so that we can get up to those, you know, to those basic, those basic standards, which I think are very important. We only had 77 structure fires last year, but a fire is a fire is a fire, and, um, and it can be a terrifying and horrible experience for anybody who's involved in it. So um, uh, 
some of us have had that experience, some of us have not, but, uh, but at least I'm glad that, that we're really getting back up to, to, uh, to a strength that I think we can defend here. Yeah, I'd say just to the structure fires, as you said, yeah, 77 structure fires, but uh, we are firefighters and uh, we do a lot more than just firefighting, which I'm sure Alderman, Alderperson Donnie, you, you realize that, but you know, we're involved in technical rescue, natural gas calls, anything that the people, that Chief Domagowski's department, you know, we, between our two departments, we're dealing with anybody who's calling 911 with whatever problem they may have even from sewer backouts or backups in their homes when their basements fill with water. Uh, you know, we're, the fire department goes and empties people's basements. So there's a lot of things we do, but yes, structure fires, we're firefighters, and that's what we do. But just in the last three days, if you think about, we haven't had a lot of fires, and I know some people have brought it up, there isn't as many fires. Well, Sheboygan's been, you know, it's, it's lucky, you know, just like any other community. You don't want to have fires. But just in the last couple of weeks, we've had maybe almost 10 structure fires, and we've also had three, three days in a row. Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, all three major good-sized structure fires that uh, people were having to get called back on three days in a row. So uh, it does happen, and we need the people to be there just to get to that, just to get to that minimum standard. And like the other person said, when we talk about standards, yeah, it's not a law, but it's a standard, and it's going to be what's looked at in the future when something happens in our community. And people say, well, did you meet the standard? There's got, they got to go somewhere. The city attorney is still here, but Alderman Donahue who's an attorney, right? <laughs> oh, more. Alderman, Alderman Lewandowski. Okay. I know you talked about with a smaller crew, you can't get to the front door and get water on the fire as fast. Correct. And I was just wondering how much difference that made yesterday at the Embers, because I, I know somebody that lived in the building and he told me he did not know that the building was on fire until a police officer or a firefighter knocked on his door. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate the question, but that's something I couldn't answer. Uh, first off, I wasn't at the scene, um, and I believe that the building, from what I've heard, and it's all secondhand, was pretty full. Whatever room was fully involved at that point, by the time even the first uh, police officer arrived on scene to give their first and report of what they saw. So... Uh, you know, not every fire is going to be there, but I've, but I've been to plenty of fires. Uh, just in the last year, we're even up in Geely Avenue and uh, North uh, 7th Street, where a fire was blown out the window. And due to the fact that it just happened to be we were moving pretty quick out of Engine 1, not to pat ourselves on the back, but we got there with the ladder company on the north side, and between the four of us, we were able to get a line into that room, a heavily fully charged room, and keep it to a one-bedroom fire. So again, those are the houses that we don't hear about a lot in the city because we keep them to one-bedroom structure fires, not an entire house loss for a family or their possessions. Thank you. All I'm going to start. I have a couple of things I'd like to ask. The three firemen that I didn't have privy to this, so I didn't know that we were going to be approving that, were already approved in last year's budget. So I'm not certain as to who made the decision not to hire three more pol or firemen. The full council didn't talk about it. We didn't know about it, but it was already budgeted. It's already in the budget. We weren't asking for anything more than what was already discovered and decided upon by full council in 2016 for the 2016 budget. So I'm real curious who makes those decisions when we, the council approves the budget who makes the decisions not to follow through with the projected approval of the budget? Who made the decision not to hire the three firemen that we had already allocated? And making this such a struggle and making it feel like we have to fight to, for the safety of our constituents, I find it offensive. And I don't understand, you know, I didn't have privy to this. You knew that they were approved. We certainly didn't. And it's a constant battle sometimes to try to understand what one hand does and the other hand does. I'm all for transparency and I'm, I'm finding that it's a bit lax when it comes to just this particular issue of the firearm. What, who made the decision? Can anyone answer that question? Who made the decision not to hire those three firemen last year? Um, if I can respond to the best of my knowledge, um, there were six retirements Mm -hmm. And so the question became whether or not those positions would be replaced. And uh, apparently the city administrator at that time decided to um, not to replace three of them. 
And how do you know that that's what happened? I mean, how come we all don't know that? Well, I think that's what that's I think that's what we were told. That's what I remember hearing. Right. Mayor, I think you should ask Chief Romas, who told him that he couldn't hire those positions. Can I open the floor again? Sure. Could you answer Chief. the question for me, please? Sure. Um, I can't answer that question. You no, can't? I can't. I can't answer that. Um, you know, I mean, I, we had a budget that was passed, and then and I was, you know, we, you. we had seven openings, one resignation, six retirements, and I was told a month after the budget was passed that I, we could only hire four people. Who told you that you could only hire okay. three people? Okay, I, I hate to say, and, and I, I don't mean to interrupt you, and I know you want to get an answer, but again, this, this was a presentation by the union to us with their recommendations. The asking of the questions whether they're budgetary issues or whatever is not what's in this presentation. I mean, we weren't going to, this, I guess it's just an item that I don't, and again, I, I'd like to have a discussion on it. Okay. And uh, I think there's a, a format or a way of doing that through public protection and safety other than the committee of the whole because tonight the union gave us a presentation. And I, I very much appreciated it. And I believe that's what we have to stick to that topic as opposed to going into budgetary issues that aren't actually on the agenda. I don't want to get into a position where all of a sudden we're talking about stuff that doesn't need, shouldn't be talked about because it's not part of the agenda. I appreciate okay. that. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. I'll bring it up with Okay. Uh, Alderman Thiel. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to thank you guys for everything you guys do. Um, I am really excited that we are keeping the three we're getting what you guys need. Um, I believe you can't put a price on, on lives, safety. You guys are the ones who are there on the scene to take care of things, and I do really appreciate what you guys do. Um, can I just answer soon this? Our, I think what we can do is when it, the budget comes to the public protection and safety, we can bring those questions aboard then. This is really about the year previous budget, so I don't All right. It's still going to be about the budget. I think we, can, we should be able to bring it up. Um, but I, am, I just want to say thank you guys. Um, I've seen your response times, even at where I work. I've seen you guys come and take care of the people. You guys are right there. You guys do a great job. I'm behind you guys 100%, so thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. Alderman Bellinger. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, again, on behalf of the Council, thanks for the, uh, the report. Um, it, it was obviously very thorough, and you guys have done a nice job, so, so thanks for that. Um, I just want to get your opinion on... Um, you're aware of the study in that issue and putting a request for proposal for that. If you have any objections to that, I mean, we, we've talked, I've talked to both of you prior to doing that. I've talked to the chief and, um, you know, I just want to, you know, just think sure. that, you know, that you say, you say to yourself that this was kind of narrow in scope and, and I, I think we need to get something you know, a five or ten year plan. Yeah, I like the word focused. So. <laughs> but uh, you're right. You know, uh, we, we have spoke. And when you think about our study, narrow or focus, we focused on the two areas that we felt were most important for the city was staffing and the department wanting to know where to put a firehouse. And we were able to do that. Uh, I've spoke to you. I, I'm not af afraid. I'm not af I'm in support of a thorough study to be done. If you want to do a study that's thoroughly done. Uh, I, as I said to you, my only fear is with any study is that how much money do you put into it and how does the council act on the results, especially if they use the same data and same standards that should be used as we use of everybody, apples to apples. And that's kind of what I expressed to you, making sure that it was apples to apples because I think we can go anywhere and find somebody to do a study on anything we really want. And I, I tr we, we talked about that and I trust that it would be a fair study. My concern would be that knowing what our study costs the study to get a, 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 a complete, very thorough study on all the things that the great things that you brought up, I'm all for it. I would just hope that if, if they came back and said, okay, yeah, we, we agree too, you need 27 more firemen per shift or whatever, uh, that the city council would have to really seriously think about it. And I, uh, that, those are pretty much my only concerns is to make sure that it would be a fair study uh, done by a very reputable firm uh, that would be out there to be able to cover all the bullet points that you had listed. Okay, thank you. Alderman Bitters. I, yeah, and, and great presentation, guys. Uh, in your key findings and some of your background, uh, you, you mentioned NFPA 1710 a lot. It's a standard. It's a brand standard industry-wide. 
You also mentioned OSHA. Now we're into the regulatory portion. I don't, I'm not aware of it, and maybe you can answer this or maybe not. Have we run into any citations, warnings, we recommendations from OSHA? We wouldn't have that unless there was an injury or a death where they would have to come and investigate. And really where that OSHA or COM30 issue is going to come up is the two in and two out rule is. And for anybody who doesn't know what two in and two out is, is that the state of Wisconsin requires that before anybody enters a, a structure fire with on a mask, with a hose line, that there must be two firefighters outside ready to go with a backup line to protect those two firefighters. So that's where OSHA or COM30 of the state of Wisconsin would come in. If, say, somebody got hurt at a structure fire and we had to file a claim and they come in and they say, Did you have the two, were you able to meet the two-in, two-out rule when these two people went in? That's where that issue would come up. Uh, you know, if, I don't know if that answers your question. Well, it, 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 understand, uh, it answers it to the point of have we officially been? No. Okay. No, we've never, uh, you I'm, know, I, I'm no one's ever been. staffing levels. Correct. Okay. I mean, we've, you. we've had, you, you know, we, you know, like any department, you're, as we say, it's not a marshmallow factory that we work in. So people get hurt and, you know, stuff happens. So, uh, you know, but we haven't had the issues where OSHA's had to come in and deal with that kind of stuff. You know, we talk about, and I, I'm kind of glad you brought it up, and just to kind of rehash, and I know button up to time here, but, you know, we, one, fail, one bullet point that we failed to speak on tonight was the, you probably saw it, it was called the rapid, in, rapid, rapid intervention team problem that we see. And what that is, is there's supposed to be two firefighters outside the building who are ready to respond for any downed firefighter who may run into trouble. They lost their air, they got hurt, they get trapped. Studies have already shown that it takes a minimum of 12 firefighters to bring one firefighter out of a building. They need 12 alone just to get that firefighter out of a building. So you could see where that would put a stress on our capabilities, and it'd be hard to get to that point. That's why, you know, we do the best we can. But um, 10 years ago, uh, Arnie Wolf died in Green Bay. Uh, I don't know if anybody remembers when Arnie passed away in the house fire up there, fell through a, seal, a floor. But the amount of resources it took that department just to get Arnie out of there, uh, they were luckily able to get his partner out. But uh, unfortunately, they were not able to get to Arnie in time. So uh, that's where a lot of those injury things would come up. And that's where OSHA and Com Wisconsin came in was like in a, in a death like Arnie's. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. We talked a lot about staffing and everything. I know the other part of your report was as far as how many fire stations we need if we go to four, where you'd place it. Can you give a share of your recommendation, you know? other than what we read? Well, we still believe, you know, at first we were, as I spoke with uh, the chief, we were kind of leaning towards that four firehouse model. Uh, but that was before the study came back and showed us what the response times would really be for a lot of these outlying, community, uh, outlying uh, areas in town. I mean, if you take, one of the recommendations would be to close Engine 1 downtown, Station 1. And as we talked to the people doing the GIS and that, and we talked about response, the main part of Sheboygan that, you as city leaders are trying to build is our downtown area. We have over 300 uh, new condo units going in. We're building an amphitheater. We have the Blue Harbor. We pride ourselves on the lake, and yet we're going to take our water rescue team and that and move it further away from the lake. Uh, you would be hurting response times by even relocating where Engine 1 is now, or Engine 2, Station 2, which is Rescue 2, by shutting that. It was the other proposed uh, thought that would really hurt the Southside residents. So uh, I'll let Cal just quickly, just because you brought up the map, here's Cal can give you a little, little info on that. This is where it gets really nerdy. Uh, <laughs> I had the, I had the uh, IFF do uh, with their GIS mapping software. I had them do what's uh, referred to as a greenfield analysis. Essentially, they took all of the fire stations in Sheboygan and they wiped them away. They said they don't exist. Then they took the three years of call data that we provided, that the department provided for them, and they plugged all of that call data in. And then they took and they optimized uh, what, how many stations it would take. And uh, their, their computer program, I believe, it was explained to me and I've explained it a couple of times, and I hope I'm not speaking uh, uh, out of school on this, but they have to limit the number. So like uh, I had them limit the number of stations to five so it could have come back as one, it could have come back as five, but uh, what they did was then they optimized the uh, call data into uh, four minute response times. 
And uh, to get to the four minute response times, which again is, uh, is an NFPA standard, to get to the four minute response times, they came up with uh, five different station locations. Uh, and again, that's using call data, and that is also utilizing not only call data, but it's also getting rid of 10%. So it's 90% of the time you're getting to these calls within four minutes with this five station model. And it, uh, it's tough to, um, sorry. It was kind of tough with that other, with all those purple lines going on to figure out where those stations are. But as you can see, most of those stations are actually station one, station four, and station three are relatively within, you know, stone's Lots. throwing distance of one another. And talking with their GIS analysts, they said uh, moving a station a block here, a block there, it doesn't really statistically, it's not statistically significant. So uh, essentially, our station one and our station four are on the dime for how, the, uh, for how GIS analysts would play stations today. Uh, so 100 years later, station one's right where it needs to be. Uh, 30 years later, station four is right where it needs to be. Station three is a few blocks out of the way, but I think with development, especially if you have uh, Aurora up there, if that ends up being, becoming, uh, coming into fruition, and maybe other growth over there, uh, the argument could be to have it stay right where it is. The only, the outliers there are stations two and stations five. Station two moves quite a bit north. Uh, it moves about eight to ten blocks north, <coughs> which does make it kind of statistically significant. And station five really moves. Uh, however, when talking with them, they said that that is only via a snapshot in time. That only accounts for the calls of the last three years. Uh, I don't know, because I'm not Chad Peleshek, which way the city is moving, but if I had to gamble, I would say south. So having Station 5 where it is and remaining in place, instead of, you know, if, we were to, if money was no object and just move the station tomorrow, uh, I would still say it's probably an unwise use of resources because it could be uh, uh, inevitable that you would move it back down there anyway. So, yeah, it, it just so happens, and I had... I, I really had no idea how this was going to come out, and uh, it came out actually way more on spot than I thought it was going to be, especially for stations one, three, and four. So to answer your question, we still oh sorry <laughs> we still believe in the five station model, but you know trying to up that those two ladder companies are staffed with three people to give because they're they're outliers to give them the optimal chance to provide immediate search and rescue or immediate fire attack, having two people on that hose line. Thank you very much. Um, since there's no other further questions for you, again, thank you very much, gentlemen, You're welcome. for coming Thank in. you all for the time. Appreciate it. Okay, I will entertain <coughs> a motion to adjourn. So moved. All, right. all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much for coming. Aye.